Today we, uh, we're talking about the state of the media currently and we want to look at it through the lens of speaking about big political events and whether the media is biased around those events. Um, my name is Thomas Barlow, I'm from Real Media. Uh, we're a new organisation that is coming together to try and put the best of independent media all in one place. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end, but please look out for the app and please look out for the Media Fund. Both of them are launching on the 10th of December at the Media Democracy Festival. But today's discussion is about, is the media biased? And if so, what can we do about it? And specifically, we're going to look at big political events such as IndyRef, Brexit, uh, international conferences like COP15 and the general election. We, I think we can all agree that to have a democracy, a functioning democracy, we need an informed populace. And the feeling is, is that we are not getting accurate and useful information that will help us make these big, important decisions about the climate, about who we elect, and about the decisions we make in referendums. So, or in referenda, in fact. Um, so... I look forward to introducing these speakers and hearing from all. We've got Angela Haggerty today from Common Space, a fantastic independent Scottish news service that deals in hard news, which is really good, a really good and unique service in the UK for a new media organisation. We've got Adam Ramsey, who's, uh, who works with Open Democracy, which is, again, a fantastic uh, independent news source and very thorough, very detailed research, and we'll be hearing from him about the COP15 summit. We also have Greg Philo from the Glasgow Media Group, which I, I'm personally slightly less aware of, but I'm really fascinated to hear about it. And because I'm here in Glasgow, I feel like this is a hotbed of new media and uh, uh, independent media. I'm really looking forward to hearing Greg speak about, about this, especially as we will have contrasting views. And lastly, I will speak a little bit on what's been happening south of the border, specifically the rise of UKIP, and the uh, general election in 2015. So, yeah, without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Angela Haggerty, and please give a warm round of applause. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. 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 <laughs> right. Is the media bias? To start off, I'm going to say that, yes, it is biased, but I think all media is biased. I don't think that there is any exception to that. I think that if we start off by saying that the myth that, that media is objective and it's completely impartial, I think it is a myth. Everybody has to make decisions when it comes to the editorial process. Particularly with newspapers, they're coming from different positions and that's stated. So I think we have to accept that there is bias everywhere. But it's the nature of that that I think we need to talk a bit more about. So the Scottish Independent Referendum I'll talk a little bit about that before I go into why Common Space arrived. How many people in here before I get started know what Common Space is? Hands up high so I can see. And how many people have never heard of it? That's quite an interesting spot actually. So, um, it's good that some of you have though, so that's really encouraging. Right, the independent referendum in Scotland Fundamentally, there was one newspaper, the Sunday Herald, that backed Scottish independence, and that was a weekly newspaper, not a daily. Of all of the other newspapers based in Scotland and throughout the UK, they either backed a no vote or they didn't declare. In the case of the Daily Record, for example, they didn't actually declare in favour of no, but they did publish the vows, so you can feel like we're being pulled in a certain direction there. Numerically, just on that basis, before you get into any of the other ideas about bias and intention, there was an imbalance in my mind in the media, if that's the case. If that's what you've got, one newspaper that backs a yes case, and it's only a weekly newspaper that's really putting that forward with any kind of rigour, but you have alternatives that are backing a no, or they're not declaring it, but kind of leaning towards it, then you're not informing the population of all of the facts. They're not getting everything that they need to know. They're not getting all of the sides of the story. They're not getting all of the cases put to them. The Scottish Independent Referendum prompted mass political engagement in Scotland. It was unprecedented. The voter registration was huge. Everybody was interested in this. People who had never been politicised before became politicised because of it. 
that put a spotlight on the media that we have in Scotland that hadn't been there before. People might have been a bit disillusioned with what was going on in, in the media before that, but there had never been a reason like Indiref to come along and really make them angry about it, really make them feel passionate about it. Suddenly the Scottish independence referendum comes along. There's some seats along the front here as well. Kevin. The independence referendum comes along and people feel like they need to be informed about something and that's when I think we realised that there was a problem. That problem had existed before the Scottish independence referendum and I think there's two main reasons for that. One is the general problem of media ownership and the, the structure of old media that exists in a lot of cases for profit, it, exi it exists for commercial purposes. That's a driving factor of it. That's a real problem. That's, that's been a long-running problem. The second problem that you've got to contend with is one about resources, about the crisis that digital media has caused for traditional media. It's rocked their commercial model. It has made it less profitable. As a result of that, you've had a lot of cuts at newspapers right across the board and in broadcasters. You can't keep producing quality journalism when you're cutting but expecting the same level of output. It, it inevitably is going to suffer. And you've had years of that decline in Scotland before you had the Scottish Independent Referendum. In terms of broadcast, despite devolution in Scotland in 1999, was it 1999? Yeah. There was no real change in the BBC structures and the broadcasting structures to reflect that change. You had a devolved parliament in Scotland, you had new powers in Scotland, political powers, MSPs, things that could be controlled in Scotland. With that, you need more media scrutiny, you need more media attention. That change didn't happen within the BBC and that's one of the places where that should have happened, where you would feel that there is a duty to reflect that change in society. It didn't happen and, it's, and the output suffered because of it. So when the referendum came around, suddenly all of these problems, all of these cracks that you had in the media that had already been there, there was a massive spotlight on that and everybody could see it. And the reaction to that was strong. It was really, really strong. You had the development of digital media, which was grassroots and it sprung up by itself. So you had websites like Wings Over Scotland. You all have heard of that. Newsnet Scotland, Bell Caledonia, you had bloggers like the wee ginger Doug who now writes for the National. You had Independence Live, look at this man Kevin Gibney over here who's looking immensely tired, he's a very hard worker. Um, but you had all of these things spring up because the people felt like they had to fill that gap themselves. That if they couldn't get the rounded view from the media that existed, then they had to put something in place to try and fill that. People funded this by themselves. All of the new media outlets have been funded entirely by the readers. There's maybe been a little bit of advertising in there, but these are digital outlets with a pretty limited readership in the grand scheme of things. They're not going to make a great amount of money out of advertising. We're talking to the tune of hundreds of thousands of pounds, at least now, because this has been going on for years, that these outlets have been funded to the tune of. Common Space was founded nearly two years ago, and the reason that we came about was we, we actually didn't exist before the referendum, so that makes us particularly interesting. We came after it. Despite the fact that we had Wines and Bella and this, this emerging movement of new media websites, what they tended to do was they were reacting to the media. They were Wings is a media, uh, a media monitor blog. He basically picks apart what the media has already put out there and shows the flaws in the reporting that you have out there. Um, Bell Caledonia is a commentary website, it's people putting opinion pieces up and analysis pieces, it's really good, it's really useful, but again it's often reacting to things that have already happened in the news. Common Space was founded because people wanted a news service that could generate news right from the start and from a different position. And that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about those bias everywhere. Because let's be honest, Common Space was set up and funded by people who predominantly support the Yes movement. So that's the state of political position. And they funded us because they wanted something that not only could, could support that, at least give that case across, but that could oppose what they see as a predominantly right-wing media in the UK. They wanted something to come from the left. 
So that's what Common Space does. We're non-particle work news. There's me as, as editor, and we have three full-time reporters, and all of us are paid. That's a development for new media as well in Scotland. We are all paid, and we all work full-time, and that's a really good development. That's a real big step. That's progress. But we, have, we do have an editorial position. We don't back political parties, and we never even took our position on the EU referendum, but we do come from the left. And if there's a second independence referendum, we will support the Yes campaign. To me, the question isn't necessarily whether... I think when we have this conversation, we talk a lot about bias and how terrible bias is and how terrible it is to have a position on things. I don't think that's always the case. Sometimes it can be useful for the media to understand what's going on and then provide a position, an informed position, as a form of guidance to people. I don't think, in principle, that that's necessarily a bad thing. I think the problem is when it is all weighted towards a particular side when you don't have enough variety in it, because it's, that's when you have a population that can't be fully informed, that doesn't have access to all the information. That's when things start to get out of kilter for me. So, common space, when I say we come from the left, it doesn't mean that we're making the case for leftist politics all the time. What it means is that we might be... If there's an economic story, for example, a big economic story, instead of going and getting the business reaction to something, We'll go to the trade unions and say, right, how does this impact workers? So it's things like that. It's just coming at something from a different position rather than us having a stated editorial view on something. We're actually very careful not to do that. I think that what we need to do when we're moving forward with conversations about the media is, is be a bit more honest about it. Be a bit more honest about the fact that there's bias from our side. And also be a bit more honest as readers, as consumers of that media, about what we really, really want from it. Because quite often when people say that they want a, bias, they want a media that is unbiased, completely objective, and it's impartial, and they, they guarantee that they're going to fund that, like Common Space, we've been surprised to find that sometimes when we do really hard-hitting stories holding the Scottish Government or the SNP to account, and they are the ruling party in Scotland, that people get very angry at us, because how could we do this? We were not supposed to be like that. And that's people's internal bias then coming out <coughs> and coming back to us. So there needs to be a bit of honesty, I think, from everyone about what it is that we really want from a media, what we're trying to create. And then let's talk about how we can do that. I think Common Space and the New Media in Scotland has come in and filled a very important gap, because we do absolutely have serious problems in the media structures in the UK, I think, and they're getting worse. For the reasons I explained in the crisis and funding is becoming more and more prominent. We see that in things like clickbait, this need to just constantly be getting hits on content, but it's not good quality anymore. Brexit, for example, which we're going to hear about a little bit more later, the Daily Mail, the Daily Express and the Sun in particular, and you may have all noticed this as well, but the tone has been in my view, plummeting since Brexit. If you thought it was bad before, I don't think that's anything compared to some of the front pages we're seeing right now. There are serious problems, but from my position, I don't want to just talk about the problems all the time. I want to think about the solutions. What can we do right now that can make a difference? Common space is something that can make a difference, and we've seen in the course of our work in just two years the difference it can make. Indie Life can make a difference. Wings over Scotland can make a difference, so can Bella Caledonia. And we need to think seriously now about how we start to fund a new media alternative that can start to change that imbalance that we have. Thank you. Adam. We're now going to be joined uh, by Adam Anthony. By the way, the format is we'll hear about eight to ten minutes from each speaker, and then we'll open it up to comments, questions, and uh, uh, from the floor, and we'll respond to those. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hello. How are you all doing? Good. <laughs> Cheering up a bit. That's better than earlier. Um, I'm not just like texting my friends. I'm talking to you. I, I have this bad habit of writing notes about what I'm going to say as I walk places on my phone. Um, so, um, as Thomas saying, I edit the UK section of a website called Open Democracy, and in February last year, um, an old friend of one of my colleagues came to him, and this, this guy, um, you might have heard of, he's called Peter O'Born, and at the time he was the chief political correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, and Peter said to my colleague Anthony, he said, Anthony, I've, I've resigned, and Anthony asked why, and so Peter explained, and the story 
he told him it was so explosive that apparently he said, you've got, to, you've got to write about this. And so eventually he persuaded Peter Oborn to explain why he resigned from the Daily Telegraph. To which the answer was, um, as well as a kind of long-term series of worries, a particular frustration that he'd been doing a lot of work around how HSBC was shutting down bank accounts for uh, Arabic men particularly, um, for no particularly good reason, and he thought this was particularly unfair, and the Telegraph repeatedly refused to publish those stories, despite the fact that this is their chief political editor. And gradually he came to realise what was going on, was that the Daily Telegraph had a massive advertising relationship with, the H with HSBC, and as he saw it, that was, as he put it, a fraud in their readers. The paper was refusing to tell the truth. And you'll remember then, later unfolded a massive scandal around HSBC and its use of essentially money laundering people in Mexico. And again, the Telegraph barely covered the story, and so at that point, Peter handed in his notice, he wrote us a long piece explaining why, which we published and became at the time our best ever read piece. And for me that was illustrative of a broader crisis in the media, and I'm going to talk about what we did next in a bit and some research we did around that. But I think it's worth repeating and kind of um, going into some more detail on what Angela's saying, because it's stuff that often I think people don't think about very much, about how the funding of newspapers traditionally works. And I think... Essentially, there were three main ways newspapers were traditionally funded, and all of them, for different reasons, have been destroyed by the internet. The obvious one is the cover price, because people don't, aren't willing to pay and subscribe online in the way that you go into a shop and you pay for a newspaper. The second one, which people talk about a lot, is conventional advertising. You know, if, you, if it used to be the main way that advertisers could, could you know, promote their wares was in a newspaper, now largely it's people like Facebook and Twitter who get that money, and newspapers don't so much. And the third way, which is absolutely crucial and we almost never talk about, is, uh, as a friend of mine put it, how Gumtree has destroyed, the, has destroyed journalism. It is that until the kind of mid-20th century, newspapers didn't often have what we think of as a front page. What they used to have was classified adverts. The you know, promotion of very local, specific uh, products, local shops and so on, was done entirely you know, through, or, not, or largely through, newspapers. And, of course, what's happened now is that everyone has a website, so you don't need to advertise that you have a shop around the corner selling things so people will Google for it. Gumtree allows people to swap these things online, eBay. So it just totally destroyed a huge revenue stream for newspapers, and in a sense one of the most important ones, because whereas advertising from big companies who could buy up huge swathes of it left papers open to allegations of bias, you know, you're not particularly worried about losing one particular small advert from a small local business if you want to run a story about how they're causing, how they've given food poisoning to their customers. So you've got, you've got this crisis in media, which has been unfolding for a long time. And, and for me, Peter's resignation was kind of um, emblematic of that, but it didn't tell a new story. But what we decided to do next was uh, think about major events coming up and how we could sort of monitor media coverage around them. And that led us to doing a big bit of research with um, an organisation called the Centre for Media Study and Power at King's, you know, the King's College London, part of the University of London. Um, and what that meant was basically for me monitoring the media going up to the Paris Climate Conference last year and then going to the conference itself to look at how big corporate bodies, big corporations were influenced the coverage. And I've got a sort of list of things we found I thought I'd just run through to give you a bit of a flavour of some of the kind of concerning things we turned up. A lot of these cases, these aren't things where we could, you know, absolutely say this is corrupt, but what I'll talk about at the end is how I think this does lead to a particular kind of tilt in the media and what that means. So, so for example, um, the weekend, or the week before the Paris Climate Conference, the New Statesman, and I, I'm resistant to criticise the New Statesman because you know, it's a progressive magazine, I, a lot of its staff I like and they do very good work, but I think it's important to point out the you know, problems that even people who are generally, I would think, on you know, share my politics have. The New Statesman's only coverage of energy or climate policy was a double-page advert from EDF, uh, which is a long explanation about how great nuclear power is and how nuclear power is the solution to climate change. Now, I don't want to get into the debate about whether they're right or not. There's a genuine, reasonable argument to be had on either side of that debate. But it does worry me significantly that in the run-up to the biggest conference in human history on climate change, the main magazine of the British left could only find a way to write about that by getting the advertising men at a major <laughs> polluter the owners of some of the biggest and dirtiest coal power stations in, in the continent to write about it. They didn't have the money or the capacity to pay journalists to do that work for them. I don't 
particularly blame the New Statesman for that fact. It's a problem of the way that the media market is working, but it's terrifying. Um, there's more obvious things like direct advertising, but again, you know, go, I, I read every paper every day for, for months running up to the conference, and the main way that we find out about what we should think about energy policy was full-page adverts brought up by the fossil fuel industry telling us you know, their key messages that we should go for gas, that uh, carbon capture and storage is a thing and it works, even though I talk to most scientists and they'll tell you that it's incredibly expensive and probably doesn't work. That, you know, and, and again, there was so little ability to get expertise on these subjects and so little actual news journalism, so, you know, so little coverage of these issues. That, that was the main way that if you read the papers, you would find out about these things at all. Again, a, a huge problem. But I think for me, the most pernicious of them all is what I call think tankery. Um, and, and there's one example of this I'll give you, but there are, this is just one of many, which is that, um, in that in the week before the conference, the Daily Mail ran a story uh, where they said that because of green energy, our lights are going to go out. So because of re renewable energy not being able to provide our needs, electricity in Britain will collapse. Now, that's a scary story. There's, you know, it sounds like it might be plausible. The scariest stories are ones that sound like plausible. What they didn't tell you is that there have been 500 stories since 2005 across the UK media saying the same thing, saying not just that it will happen at some point, but that it's going to happen within the next few months, and that it's not happened once within that period. In fact, within that period, there's only been two uh, power outages in Britain caused by a lack of supply, and both of them were because of failures in coal power stations, nothing to do with renewable energy at all. But also important is that all of these stories were placed by the Centre for Policy Studies, a uh, right-wing think tank who, when I rang them and harangued them for a while, would refuse to tell me which company it was that paid for the report claiming that this is going to happen, this headline which had been concocted by a right-wing think tank funded by we don't know who and repeated across the right-wing media. And this is a meme you know, that now people generally believe, that, that renewable energy will cause power outages, despite the fact that there's no particular evidence for that to be the case and that it's never happened despite them repeatedly claiming it. And so for me, that, that leads to the important question, which is that, you know, as Angela said, everyone's biased, and that's appropriate. You know, it's, it's absolutely right that as I edit a website, and there's some things I think are important and other things I don't think are important. So, you know, it's impossible for me to write and cover every single potential issue. So I bring my bias to the editing of a website. That's true of every journalist as everything. At the, at the very least, they're choosing to spend their time on this issue, not that issue. But the, the problem has come where rather than there being funding for journalism, there's, uh, you know, that collapses. And so who gets to decide what we hear in the news? People who can pay public relations experts to go and tell journalists what to write about. People who can push into the hands of a journalist an easily concocted story. And what we've seen is a massive shift in the number of jobs as, as journalism has collapsed. We've seen a huge rise in the PR industry. The number of people working for public relations companies employed by base business to essentially write news stories for newspapers and get them, get puff pieces into the papers has gone up enormously. And I, I think that um, that there's though. And um, how long have I got, Tom? You've got another two. Another two minutes. That's fine. Well, so and there's two other things I want to say about this. Uh, I want to disagree slightly with Angela because Angela talked about um, how the media is done for profit, and I I think that's not really true anymore because largely newspapers particularly make a loss. So no one buys a newspaper. You have to be really stupid to buy a newspaper to make money out of it. In fact, what we have instead, and this has been increasingly the case, I think, is people buy newspapers because they want political power. But people who buy newspapers are very, very rich men. If they wanted to make money, they'd buy oil wells or houses in London, usually houses in London, or they'd be speculating on the price of houses in London, more likely. They buy newspapers in order to assert their political power. It's a different thing. And that causes, and that, what that means is that these relationships aren't just about advertising. Because, you know, while they do want to stay afloat, I don't think it is the case that, you know, newspapers will only do whatever is in their immediate commercial interest. Because if it wasn't, you know, the commercial interest is shut down normally. Most of them don't make a profit. And so, just to give one more illustrative example of that, um, one of the things I was fascinated about during the Paris Climate Conference was what we didn't expect to see was any outright climate change denial. Because, basically, if you deny climate change, any serious scientist will laugh at you. It's not a sort of serious belief anymore. But instead, what we had was the front page of the Spectator. We had, you know, in the week of the Paris Climate Conference, was a whole, you know, story about how climate change is all just invented by this conspiracy of green NGOs who are living off it, and these scientists who make their living out of it. It's all one big conspiracy, and so on. And similarly, we had pieces in the Times and the Telegraph saying the same thing. And you look into what was going on there, and it was all largely focused around quite a small group of friends, 
guy called Matt Ridley right at the centre of it. Now, Matt Ridley happens to own England's biggest coal mine, as well as having a column in the Times. But perhaps more importantly, he is just good friends with the editor of the Times, and I spoke to journalists at the Times who talked about how they had repeatedly complained that Ridley was getting their stories spiked, getting stories, getting the headlines changed on their stories, get, you know, having errors published about their stories, even though their stories been accurate, and so on. And a you know, huge amount of anger, but there is what I would see as a very different kind of class interest of the network of a group of friends who've been friends for a long time, who all know each other from school and university. And that kind of class inter- interest, I think, is just as important in media dominance as the direct questions of the profit motive in the media immediately. Because, as I say, no one buys a newspaper to make money out of it. So um, we can talk forever about this stuff. I'm going to wrap up there. I hope that was helpful a bit. And what I would say is that, for me, you know, the story of the Paris Climate Conference and climate change, the reason we chose that wasn't particularly because climate change is important, although, of course, climate change is very important. But because it's illustrative of, I felt, the ways that it's not, you know, some kind of narrow conspiracy. It's not that there is a um, kind of, you know, people want to present a, the journalists want to present a bias as such within the media themselves. It's that, firstly, the way that it's set up, who, you know, who has the money, the way the resources work has changed. As, as funding for newspapers has collapsed, people have to find news in their own way, and that means they're getting given them more and more by PR agencies. And also, you know, there is a very powerful ruling class in Britain, as there are across the world, and they all use newspapers to assert their own interests as they use other bits of society to assert their interests, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. So, thank you. heard my talk before. So. <laughs> Please welcome Greg Philo. I mean, there's a lot of things I can talk about. I'm, I, what I'll do is to set briefly a kind of context for I think politics and the media are now at this moment. We're at a very strange juncture. We're in the aftermath of an enormous financial crisis. The the credit crisis, the banking crisis. At the same time, there are a series of social movements coming and developing very fast, which are really to do with the growth of new technologies, of the IT revolution. It would surprise you to know that since the year 2000, 30,000 jobs have gone on Wall Street because of the IT revolution. The wholesale across the middle classes in America and increasingly here, jobs are just disappearing in law, accountancy, insurance. The middle class is under enormous threat because, quite simply, the jobs are being taken and done by computers. There's a very interesting book called Humans need not apply, which you can look up, which is, is exactly about this. The one called The Rise of the Robots, appropriately by a guy called Ford. Different <laughs> one. But, but there's a, a sense of insecurity, which is actually not to do with the, with, with, with the traditional assumptions about capitalism. But nonetheless, those are in their own right very powerful. We've seen the deregulation of the banks, the the movement of the right wing in the Labour Party to ascendance in, in, in Labour. The, one of the consequences of the rise of Tony Blair and Mandelson was an a almost evacuation of political space in Britain in the sense that <coughs> left-wing alternatives, critical alternatives to neoliberalism, to the rise of the right, right-wing e- economics, to deregulation, to privatisation, to attacks on trade unions, those kinds of arguments were in effect margin- marginalised from the point of view of the left. Because once Tony Blair had moved the, the Labour Party to the right, in essence the bulk of what was seen as legitimate political conversation in our country was now... A, a space between the 
Labour Party, which was on the right, and the, and the Conservative Party. The BBC, which is supposed to be public, supposed to be representing a range of views, interprets its rubric as being simply true to report what goes on in Parliament. So if Parliament is substantially to the right, or almost all to the right, then the BBC sees no, sees no reason to, to report that section of the population which are on the left. Even if its percentage is quite high, even if there are, is a huge number of people who want left-wing uh, policies in some areas. I mean, some of you might know that I put forward a proposal for the wealth tax in the year 2010, saying you could simply pay off the national debt by doing a tax on the richest 10% of the population. 20% of their wealth would pay off the whole national debt. We put that to an opinion poll. 74% of the population wanted that as a solution in, in the opinion poll. But you couldn't get that onto the mainstream media, not on, the, on its central main programmes. They would discuss it on the kind of knockabout programmes like Jeremy Vine's show or something like that. But what I'm saying to you is that the critical left alternative was substantially excluded. At the same time, the problems that the bulk of the population were experiencing actually increased through, as I've said, the, the destruction actually of middle class jobs, the, the attacks on trade unions, the casualization of labor the, for, for working class people and for increasingly middle class people. So people who have got university degrees found themselves working in call centers. And because the, of the, 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 the simple fact that there were not enough skilled jobs left. While for people who were in, in the bottom half of society in terms of income, their work, their conditions, the pressures on them, the, the pressures in terms of housing, rents, the, 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 the problem that trade unions had shrunk you know, from around 15 million in, in the 70s to 7 million, that many people working in service sectors were not trade unionised, did not have any way, real, really, real way of fighting back against these processes. That all of those problems created a society which was intensely insecure, in which people were scared, scared of each other, scared of their jobs, scared about pensions, scared about health, Get about waiting lists, and that extended right through whole sections of our society. Really only the top 20-30% could feel secure in, in the money they'd accumulated or in their house price or whatever else. If you think about London, over half of the people in London rent their homes, rent where they live. We think about London in terms of high housing prices, but each time the, the price of houses go up, the price of rents go up. And for the people at the bottom of that society, the conditions are absolutely appalling. The bottom 10 to 15 percent of the population have what is now called politely negative wealth. That means they own less than nothing. Their debts are greater than their total assets. And you've got to watch the the strawberry film, I, Daniel Blake, to, to get a sense of what it's like if, if you're in that position, if you're trying to claim benefits or you're being told you know, that you, when you're dying that you're fit for work. So those problems created right through the society a gap, a kind of mixture of fear, apprehension, search for other kinds of solutions, which was taking place at a time when there was an almost evacuation of political discussion for the bulk of the population, people who relied on the BBC or the, or the mainstream press or whatever. But within that population, there's probably 20% of the people who are informed outside the mainstream press and outside the BBC. And those people are using social media, they're using different kinds of websites, they're communicating with each other. And that's a phenomenon we saw here in the independence referendum, where it was quite fascinating to see how young people communicated essentially with each other, laterally, horizontally. And that is one of the most interesting things about 
the referendum for me as a social scientist anyway, that as the media coverage intensified, as the pressures, the, the attacks upon the, the, the yes side of the referendum increased, the actual vote for that side also increased. <laughs> so it was exactly the opposite of what you'd expect if, if you thought there was a simple relationship between media coverage and, and, and what people were doing. Because the, the actual support for independence went from something like, if you look, take 2008, from something like 27, 28% in 2008, up to 45% by the time of the referendum result. So that's an extraordinary change at a time when the bulk of the media, a lot of them, certainly the mainstream media, the papers like the Express, the Daily Mail, the, 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 the Times, the Telegraph, just pumped out you know, anti-referendum uh, headlines. But So it was still interesting to see, sorry, I mean anti-yes headlines, that, that it is possible to take on and attack a dominant message. Now, I can say to you that my position on the referendum was that I was a left-wing member of the no side, right? But nonetheless, I find it, as a social scientist, those phenomena are extremely interesting to look at. But what they teach us is that it is possible to develop alternative media, alternative means of communication, for that group of people that are not primarily informed by the mainstream media. But that still leaves us with a big problem. What do we do about the rest of the population, if you want, who are still reading the Daily Express, the Daily Telegraph, the, or watching the BBC? How do you get to those people? And I think the solution during the Scottish referendum, which I'm enormously impressed by, and I was very close to many of the people on the yes side, because we were all on Facebook together, and a lot of them were my ex-students, and they were very upset with me for not being on their side, but they didn't unfriend me, <laughs> because they liked me, or something, <laughs> for whatever reason. You know. but we, and I was amazed by their work rate, by the fact that they were going out, you know, for, for four, five, six hours sometimes in a day, out in the night, banging on doors, talking to people, you know. And, and I think, truthfully, of the... the produced a much greater work rate than the other side. And they, this, that simple process of talking to people, of constantly being in shopping centres, you know, giving out leaflets, you know, that, that is a kind of social media which actually really works. A face-to-face -face contact where you say to people, don't believe what you're reading in the papers, it's false or whatever. And that is terribly, terribly important. And I found that also with our work on Israel and Palestine. That very many people who said to me they'd come to understand that conflict in a different way had simply said, well, they talked to, people, to Palestinians in the street or people who were at stalls or they had, they had learnt in alternative kinds of ways. And those channels, those alternative channels of communication are absolutely crucial. But we're still left with the question of how, what do we do about the mainstream media? How do we attack them? How do we take on those kinds of issues? Because you can see with the rise of Jeremy Corbyn and indeed with Bernie Sanders in, in, the, in America that, that, that there is a, a terrific attack <clears throat> produced on, by the mainstream on those kinds of alternative ideas, alternative platforms, new sorts of politics which challenge the existing audience, the existing economic structure. So when Bernie, Bernie Sanders stands up and says, I'm a socialist, the economy is rigged, that is like a lightning bolt through American politics. Nobody says things like that. The, 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 and the, the response of the American media was just not to cover it. There was sort of, sort of no way like, no, they would actually could discuss that kind of position. And in a way, that's what Jeremy Corbyn in the position he's in, because even the more, even the most modest kind of left approaches now are seen or presented as if they are sort of mad, kind of crazy left wing. You know, people talk about Trotskyism and things. You wonder, have I got any idea what Trotsky actually said? I mean, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, I mean, I'm, they're, they're, I know them and they're fine. But, I mean, what they are saying is not the same as Trotsky, you know? Not anywhere near. So, you know, privatise the railways, let's have a good health service, 
You know, this is not Leon Trotsky. He really isn't. <laughs> I think he was a bit, quite a long way to the left of all that. But the point I'm making to you is how do we get those arguments across? How do we get a left-wing platform across? Is there anything to do about the mainstream media? And I think the answer is yes. I mean, I'm been help, trying to help and work with people in the Labour Party to develop a communication structure which works much more strongly, which is better, which is better informed, which gets material out uh, in a better way. And I do think that is important because some of the mainstream media will come round to your side. And this is fascinating because the reason they do it is just for for circulation reasons. I mean, something like the Daily Mirror is selling to a working class, traditional left-wing Labour voting audience. A lot of its readers actually support the policies of Corbyn. Very, very many of them do. Them do. Probably 90% if you give them the policies. So the Mirror is actually complaining to, to the Labour Party and to Corbyn and McDonald people and people like that that they're not getting enough stories, that they do need a closer relationship, that they... And the Mirror would be prepared to, to, let, to, to do more. Oddly, the Sun has run very, very good, powerful piece here, which astonished me. You know, a very, I remember reading a recently a very, very strong piece uh, on, on, on the new Labour politics of Corbyn, which is just straightforwardly reported them, didn't criticise. I wonder what that was. <laughs> it's like an alarm clock or something. We've got to wait for it to go yeah, bing. You know. <laughs> okay, so that's an important issue. But another issue for us here is how do we use the media? How do we take part? And what I've found is that there is actually an enormous amount of space in the media that we can use. We can form groups which can criticise the media, we can monitor, we can constantly complain, but actually we can get onto the media because there, there are an enormous amount of small platforms in local news, local radio, in phone-in programmes, letters. I asked my students, my honours students last year, if they would just see how much of that space they could use. And they filled the whole media unit in Glasgow University with letters that they'd written to the papers. Which, and they, it was astonishing how many that they got published in, in papers like the Daily Express, the Daily Mail. You know. I mean, they would write, and very radical good letters, they would write things like, I'm a young student at Glasgow University, and I notice that you've been saying a lot about benefit scroungers. Well, I cannot help but wonder if it's not the bankers that are the biggest benefit scroungers. <laughs> and this would go into the Daily Express and, and to the Daily Mail. So we, one day, I remember, we got four separate letters into the Daily Express, into a single day, this edition of the Daily Express. It's amazing, because the Daily Express is desperate to get anybody who is under 60 you know, reading their papers. So if you, you know, if you write and say, oh, I'm a young student, then they will go in, you know, because that's okay. And the same for radio programmes, and, and something like the Jeremy Vine programme, I mean, I've been astonished how much you can get on. But get on and criticise, argue, say, what we've been told is lies. This is false. What is really being said is that most people in Britain, arm yourselves with the figures, most people in Britain want wealth taxes, the great majority want the railways nationalised, um, overwhelmingly, people want more money spent on the NHS. These are the policies that are now being pushed from the left. Why don't we hear about them? Why are programmes like Question Time filled with right-wing figures? Why is there never a proper debate on television? There's all these left-wing alternatives. When are you going to put it on? <coughs> attack, attack, attack them. Don't stop sitting, uh, looking at the TV and say, oh, it's blooming awful, I hate it, oh, God, I can't stand it. Oh, look at that again. Phone, complain, get in, argue, because it's our media. We own the BBC. The most important communication system probably in the world is the BBC. We own it. It's ours. Get on it and insist that our views are heard. Okay. Well, that would be difficult to follow, damn it. Um, hello, I'm Tom Sparlow from Real Media, again. Um, 
we've actually done quite a lot of discussion on what are the flaws with the media currently and also on what are some of the solutions in our previous talk. So I would encourage you, if you're interested, to check out our YouTube channel, check us out on Facebook or whatever, check out Real Media. We've discussed some of these things, but they've been excellently covered here. Uh, certain things like ownership, the social class of people who report in the media, upper middle class, Oxbridge graduates, predominantly populate most of the national press and the BBC. Um, advertising. Fear of being sued, um, fear of appearing unpatriotic, the resources to fact check things, which is why journalists take news from think tanks and they take it from PR companies, because it costs money to fact check information you and I give them. You know, so they need trusted sources, it costs them time. So, resources is a problem. The move now that we're following America. Uh, the US is now around about 85% of journalists in America are working in, for PR companies, for uh, public relations companies. Well, in Britain, it's over half of journalists now work for public relations companies. And of course, public relations is another term, a new term, for propaganda. That's what originally it was called, propaganda. So it's a brilliant piece of PR to change the name there. And also, the, a lot of uh, the media, again, due to resources, the stenography. It, reports on what happens in Parliament and not the rest of the country or anything else. We had for years during the Blair years uh, discussions of what Brown said about Blair or what Blair said about Brown and nothing about what the impacts of their policies were on everyday people. These have all been covered and, and uh, but funnily enough I made a comment that Ken Loach then made a few days later about something that's not news which is drama. The BBC has increasingly retreated into producing historical dramas rather than contemporary dramas, and I think this is a very interesting phenomenon. I, Daniel Blake, it, when I watched that film last night here in Glasgow, I looked at all of my mates, all of them uh, degree educated, all of them supposedly or should be middle class, and I would say every single one of them has lived through some part of what went on in that film, right? And yet, this is the first contemporary drama tackling that since austerity began in 2010, since the financial crash. And it's a film, it's not even on TV. So why, why is that? Why are those issues being covered? Well, to come back to and to tell a story about... Uh, I want to sort of tell a story about the general election. I, want to, I think we should speak about Brexit and there's a big... Uh, you know, elephant in the room if we don't, but I'm sure that will come up in the discussion and, and we, can come, we can come back to that. But it, the story of the election is an interesting one because it's about what some people call the Overton window. It's about shifting the window of debate. What do you talk about? Not whether you win those debates, you know, but what is it that we're talking about? We know for, for a fact that despite the protests, the protests of the right, that Yes, we have been talking about immigration. We've been talking about immigration for 35 years. You know, 35 years it's been populating the front covers of the major national newspapers every single day. We know that, right? And we've won a lot of those arguments for a very long time. But after a while, certain ideas become common sense, whether you won the arguments or not. Because really, it seemed like that's something that we've been talking about. And that's very interesting. So... That feeds into the elections and where we came uh, with Brexit. A study showed in 2014 that the majority of the populace had moved left-wing and wanted left-wing solutions to the crisis that had been caused by the banks and the, the following austerity that had been implemented by the Conservatives. And we had seen prior to that point large social movements that were barely covered by the media but originally covered quite highly. Originally, student protests, UK and Cut, Occupy, and then eventually the media started covering these less and less. We started covering less the stuff that People's Assembly were doing and the marches they were doing, or what people were doing you know, with United Community Union to uh, fight for welfare, um, protection of the welfare state. And instead, we got a lot of benefits street. And we, sometimes on Channel 5, there'd be up to five hours of what we call poverty porn. Five hours of People like us, Benefit Street, you know, uh, uh, oh, look at the poor, aren't they funny, don't they speak weird, you know? Like, don't they drink a lot? Don't they eat badly? Like, that's, that was the coverage that the media was giving, 
started to give around about 2014. Interestingly, in the news, what happened was the BBC, and the BBC accounts for 70% of uh, TV and radio news, the BBC started to give disproportionate coverage to UKIP. Even though they were polling lower than the Greens, and even though they had no MPs, suddenly Farage, Nigel Farage, was a mainstay of political commentary. He was in fact getting as much coverage as the governing parties and the Labour Party, and five times the amount of the Green parties, or Plaid Cymru, or the SNP, or the DUP, who had more uh, MPs and had, a larger, uh, had larger parties and larger uh, polling. So, uh, you know, and, and they were talking, by the way, on things that they should have never talked about, like floods. Do you remember the floods that happened in South West England? Well, UKIP councillors came out and said that was because of gay marriage. Right? I mean, I don't understand how that could have been given a prominent spot on the BBC. It's not, whether, it's not even farcical enough like climate denial to consider. It is not newsworthy. But this does tie into also that crush on resources. And people wanting sensationalism, with, uh, the media wanting sensationalism to get clicks, <coughs> to get money in. And also because it's easy copy. You can go to Donald Trump rally. He'll say something for you that gives you your copy tomorrow. So why bother doing the hard work of representing issues that affect everyday people when you can have a completely bizarre spectacle? So there's part of that. I'm not saying that necessarily the BBC suddenly decided to give UKIP a lot of coverage purely because they were out to sabotage the left, though that's potential. there's potential in that, but possibly because of this spectacle element. So... Um, we then see the independence referendum, Project Fear, and that actually has a counterproductive effect. In fact, Pro Project Fear actually mobilises a lot of people and raises the uh, pro-independence vote. And that's quite interesting. So in that spirit, Miliband, who had an appalling 2014 conference, a completely dispiriting um, event for everyone involved, from what we can tell, does decide to come up with one piece of concrete policy. Not any of those things that were put on the headstone, which were completely banal and meaningless, as we all were well aware, why on earth they carved it into stone is anyone's guess. But what he did promise is that he would break up media monopolies. He must have thought this was a win-win, um, because, you know, they hate me anyway, so I may as well promise to break them down. And because of Leveson inquiry and the hacking inquiries, you know, maybe this will make me popular. But no one really noticed that, except for the key owners of the media. And that's why we had reports. Reports on the front page of The Independent, who are in the same building as The Sun, reporting uh, Rupert Murdoch storming around the offices of The Sun, slapping things off desks, screaming at his editors and writers, saying, you are not attacking Ed Miliband enough. If you do not destroy Ed Miliband, if you do not destroy the Labour Party, we are finished, Right? Openly reported, the front page, and very, not many people noticed that. But they went very clearly, and again, 80% of the press is owned by five billionaires. 80% of the press owned by five billionaires. It's worth remembering that. So what we see is, and there's a great um, website called Election Unspun to get, these, uh, get this information, is we see um, that... There was a series of buzzwords that were used in the elections. The most popular words used in the media were things like English votes uh, for English people, red ed, long-term economic plan, which is the, uh, the Tories' way of saying we've got an economic plan, and apparently that people had confidence in that despite five years of utter failure. Um, leftists, red lines. These were the buzzwords that were uh, largely printed. In terms of positive lead articles, Labour had three times more negative lead articles than they had positive, where the Conservatives had more positive than negative. It was incredible, an incredible amount. They were actually counted up the amount of articles and the column inches given to trashing the Labour Party as opposed to supporting it. Right? And the BBC takes its lead from the press. So when the BBC takes its lead from the press in terms of news, especially around the elections, certain things get pushed up the agenda and certain things get pushed down. In all polls around the general election, uh, it, was, it was widely recognised that the two key issues for people were uh, the economy and the NHS, right, in, in all the polls. So they should have been given, according to Election on Spun, roughly 
similar amounts of press coverage and TV time. In fact, uh, the economy got more than triple the amount of coverage. So what does that say? Again, the Tories were seen as, strong, as being strong in the economy for no good reason. Uh, as I say, they were complete failures by any standard, including their own. Um, and uh, the NHS, which Labour was seen as strong on, was completely underreported, especially during the very last week of the election, where the <coughs> NHS dropped off all discussion whatsoever. It dropped out of the top ten points of discussion in the press, right? So I'm not saying there's people with cigars and top hats in the back room making decisions. There's many reasons that lead into this. But there's certainly, very clearly, for Murdoch especially, open political bias and a clear strategy to de-prioritise certain topics and prioritise other topics. And that leads to giving an impression of competence and ultimately support for a particular worldview, that proposed by the Conservative Party, and uh, demolishing the others. And still, despite that, despite all of that, again, this so-called crushing defeat for Labour led to actually the 12 seats that they won their majority by were 900 votes. 900 votes. If trade union socialist coalition hadn't stood in those 12 areas, Labour would have won those 12 seats. In fact, they would have probably won about 25. We also now know that there was, despite this uh, election fine that they're talking about for Labour a lot, that there's uh, large potential that was a quite large electoral fraud carried out by the Tories to secure those key marginal constituencies. So despite this, what I'm trying to say is, despite this media bias, and there clearly was media bias around the general election, and you can check the studies by Loughborough, Cardiff, election on the spun, there's a lot of quantitative studies on this, they still only had a negligible impact, but where they did have an impact and where they do have an impact is in marginal constituencies, and because of the bizarreness of our electoral system, that does count. Will it count in the future? And I'd like to end on a couple of, um, I'd like to end now on a couple of uh, discussions about what we can do or what may happen. It's, um, for the future, I would suggest that it is unlikely that daily newspapers will survive three, four, five more years. Because even though people like Rupert Murdoch are losing tens of millions a year on publications like The Sun, his board will not stand for that too much longer. Um, eventually, daily newspapers probably will disappear and we'll start seeing maybe weeklies or you know, three times a week or something like that. That may be the case. Um, I think in light of that and in light of all of this advertising going through Google and Facebook, around about 80% again of advertising money going through those places, it's interesting to have heard the proposals by Aaron Bassani and the Media Reform Coalition. Aaron Bastani, in discussions that we've had and we've publicised them on Real Media's YouTube, talks about BBC reform. He says, it's our money and the left has never really taken a consistent approach to dealing with the BBC. The right has. It attacks, it attacks, it attacks. It gets what it wants from it. It gets the changes it wants where it can. And it attacks a lot. We do not have a consistent policy of engaging with the BBC, yet it is a publicly funded institution, even if it is not publicly controlled. Um, in fact, we know Rona Fairhead, was done, who's the chair of the BBC Trust, was also the chair of HSBC. We know one of the other directors of the Trust was also a CEO of BAE Weapons Systems. So we know at the moment it's not controlled uh, by the people, but we'd like it to be. Can we do BBC reform? Yes, I think there's potential there to take the news budget, which is about 300 million a year, take a third of that, make it contestable for independent media, 130 million a year. But Outside of these big things like a Google tax and BBC reform, we can support our own media. And I think that's hopefully where we can uh, make the most ground. We can support the Real Media app and we can support the media fund that we're launching. We can fund independent media and support new media, especially to do investigative journalism and actual news reporting instead of commentary. I think that's something we should try and move into quickly and strongly. And uh, finally, I'd just like to... Uh, say that we're doing media training workshops on interview techniques, press releases, getting your stories into the media. If you're interested in that, you can come down tomorrow or you can get in touch with us and we'll come back and do them again. Uh, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Jeff. I've now got to chair this. Uh, can I take any questions or contributions from the floor? Okay, uh, we'll start here and then we'll go here.
Just take a couple more contributions and then we'll do them all in one go. Is that so? Is that okay? Yeah. Stars, three reporters. 
And that's the reality of court reporting at the moment because it's too expensive to send people along so they just take money from agencies, you know. And to me, that's a real problem. What we're doing, and what we've done, we've set up a website called Byline, which is complementary to what a lot of you guys do. And Byline allows people who say you're interested in a particular subject, if you're interested in reporting something, not only can you put it on our website, but hopefully we can set up a way you get paid for it, you can crowdfund it, because for too long, there's a lot of good journalism out there, but what we have to ensure, what Byline's about, is making sure that people get paid for the work they do. And to me, that's the most important thing. But I think there's so many interesting things to discuss in this, but the main thing I say is don't despair. There are more people reading more news from more sources than there ever have been in human history. You can get your voice heard out there. 20, 40 years ago, Angela and myself, none of us would have got here, but now we can put stuff up and people like it and we do it well, people follow us. And I think it's actually a fantastic time to be involved in the media. For all its faults, there's never been a better thing. Thanks. Now we have to applaud everybody who speaks. Um, Okay, let's hear from the internet and then, uh, and then we'll get some responses from the speakers if that's okay. Okay, this is from uh, Fiona Graham. Uh, in most of Scotland, local media is, is extremely biased towards right wing establishment. Surely the only way is to set up independent local media. Thoughts on that? I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure we've covered that a little bit and I'm sure we'll cover that a bit more. Uh, is there anyone else before we tackle this? No, I think we've got enough now and hopefully it will spark up some more. Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, if we go from the left, and Angela. I'll try to be really quick, because as soon as you get to the q and I've got even like only a couple of people put their hands up at the start by the end of it, everyone's got their hands up. So, um, But why bias can be important? The reason for that is because if you have, in my view anyway, if you have straight news reporting, if it's done well, if it's done um, and the the most kind of straight laced way you can with news reporting. You don't reach any conclusions in a news report, you shouldn't reach conclusions. You shouldn't comment on the news that you're reporting. You report the news and you try and get some comments to accompany that and you should try and get balanced commentary to give an idea of some of the views out there. But for a reader, that doesn't necessarily mean that it makes that, that you can have an informed position on it. If it's something complicated, like the economy, for example, I'm not an economist. I could read a, a news report about something going on in the economy. It doesn't mean that I necessarily know what to think of that or where that might fit within my wider political views. I might need a bit of help to interpret that. That's where journalists can come in and with informed um, you know, being collectors of news, they can then give an informed view of what that news might mean. So, and you, you see that in what we call campaigning journalists, people like George Monbiot maybe, for example, who report, who report on very specific areas and then they tend to do a lot of commentary on that because it's about interpretation. So I think that that can still be a really valuable and important thing, but I still think it does kind of get you into the realms of what people consider to be biased. What is bias? That's the point that gentleman over here made. But you also brought up the question of facts. People need to report the facts. I don't know anyone that can agree on what the facts are. We talk about the facts as if they're these like sacred things that, that exist and are pure, but they're not. There are a lot of facts out there, a lot of different ways to interpret things like data. It's not just as simple as the facts. And that then leads, I think, to a lot of what we interpret as being, as being biased. And it gets quite complicated and quite murky, I think. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, and it's something that I hope Adam might elaborate a bit on, we talked about how um, actually there's a very, you know, for all of the news and all that that's out there, a lot of that comes from only a few sources. And I think you talked about this at a, a talk we did together recently. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that James is talking about, court reporting, which is a vital thing, really, and really underdone these days. It tends to be that newspapers get a lot of that copy from agencies. And I think that Adam's got a great statistic on that, that the majority of the news that populates the, 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 the newspapers and websites in the world, a lot of it comes from a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny number of news agencies. And they, they ultimately kind of control that news flow, and that's really scary. Yeah. Um, I'll start with that then. I think the study is 90, a few years ago there was a study which showed that I think 95% of <coughs> stories online, including discussion pieces, were based on basic news stories which come from the world's three biggest news agencies. So you know, even kind of you know more radical left commentary, what it's discussing is the basic facts as established by three massive corporate media empires. 
um, you know, AP and Reuters and whatever the French one's called. So, you know, that, that, I find that terrifying. And for me, to come back to the question about bias, I always think that kind of misses the point. The point of journalism is to hold power to account. And, of course, it's always biased, because as Angela says, you've got to pick what facts you write about. You know, I, I could write a whole story about tonight and write about how the ceiling was green and the walls were white and the lights were on and, you know, they're boring, but, you know, those would be true facts. It wouldn't tell you anything useful about the content of the event tonight. What you choose to write about is always taking a bit of information and saying the rest of that I'm not going to tell you about. And so that is a process of bias, the editorial process. The process of writing is always bias, it's always saying, this thing is important, that thing isn't important, this thing is relevant, that thing is irrelevant. So, yeah, I agree. You know, it's, everything is intrinsically biased. The question is whether you're honest about your biases, and whether those biases are an attempt to challenge power or to, to, you know, to attack people who don't have the same amount of power. Um, there's a bunch of things, I'll try and run through them. Uh, uh, on the New Statesman, yeah. I mean, left and right in relative terms, aren't they? The New Statesman is to the left of most of the media in the UK and to the right of me. Um, those things can both be true. Um, is the New Statesman a, a, New Statesman a left wing publication? It's more left wing than the Times. It's. That's not what we say. <laughs> I guess what, what I meant was in the context of the British media, it's, I would argue, the most left wing mainstream magazine. Now, the fact that that is basically a Blairite-ish publication, or at least Miller Bandite publication, tells you a lot about the politics of the British mainstream media, but it's also true that it is basically the most left wing of the sort of magazines which you would get on the, you know, the newspaper review, uh, normal, you know, normal media discussion of the, paper, of the papers. It's, you know, it's also quite right wing compared to me and a lot of the population. Um, uh, court reporting, just to, I mean, I absolutely agree, but just to add to that, um, another thing I found, just to go back to the same example I was talking about, most amazing, just, just about the Paris Climate Summit, was I was on what I call baddie watch, so I'd go around going to the kind of events organised by the kind of big corporate lobbyists who were there, and the cold climate conference is full of corporate lobbyists. What I was amazed by was realising that I was often the only journalist there. You know, you'd have, like, I, I, I did crash this event, we had Al Gore here at the biggest corporate lobbyists in America, you know, all these big industry figures lobbying all the big, it was like the, the event for American politicians at the Paris Climate Summit. I was the only journalist in the room. You know, and like, what the hell were everyone else doing? Well, it turns out there aren't enough journalists left to cover everything, and so basically everyone could only spend time covering the actual core of the negotiations that were going on, and no, no paper would, you know, fund someone to go around gate crashing the parties where they were actually discussing what they were going to agree the next day, and, you know, do the informal politics which actually makes the decisions. And, you know, I could give you other stories similarly just from that conference about exactly that thing. You know, so it's not just court reporting, it's also corporate reporting. It's also, you know, the, the holding to account of where the power actually is rather than the stenography, as you were talking about earlier, Tom, of the kind of formal proceedings in the room. And, um, and you know, anyone knows that the real decisions in any organisation are made outside the room in the pubs afterwards around a drink rather than in the formal negotiations. Um, and what else is important? Local media was a question we got. Um, yes, investing in our own local media is important, but it's worth saying, A, I think you've got to pay journalists to do proper news media. You can't just say, we're all going to volunteer and do this and it's all going to be fine. Yeah, I've got no problem with people doing those things, but real hard news journalism takes, you know, means people have to have salaries, they have to go down to a court case and write about what happens and sit in court and write about it. You know, it takes time, it takes professionalism, it takes skill, and that means you've got to pay people to do it, and so you need money somehow. But the, the good news is that just as the income has collapsed in journalism, sorry, the... Um, it's not, it's not as you, it's this. Oh, I see. Um, just as the income has collapsed in, in journalism, the other thing that's fallen is capital costs. So whereas you used to have to own a massive printing press and, you know, huge office buildings, to produce journalism. Those costs have largely gone. I can do almost all my reporting with the machines you see in front of me, my laptop and my phone. That's all I need. In fact, I'm going to go and do my job from my brother's bedroom in Amman next week in Jordan because he's living there and why wouldn't I? It's fun. Um, you still need to pay salaries, but at least you don't have to be rich enough, you know, multi-millionaire, buy up huge bits of machinery in the way you did. And so it has got a bit cheaper. But, um, so yes, a local media project, but don't think you can just do it in a voluntary way. You've got to find ways to get money in to pay it. Me, go on. Um, I have a few little points to make. 
I'm, um, I'm not sure I quite go with your definition on bias. I've just, I can see so many of my students here, I better just be clear. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I say is that, I mean, of course you're right with what you said, but selectivity in terms of deciding what's relevant and what's not, I don't think it's quite the same as what we would understand by bias. So if you went to the Paris conference and there was one scientist who was uh, saying that he didn't believe that climate change was made by humans, and then you had 99 who said that it was, and you only reported the one, people would say, well, that's very biased. That represents a clear attempt to present an account which willfully or deliberately misses out a key uh, set of opinion or a key set of arguments or a key piece of information. So people understand that. They would understand that in a different way than if you didn't report that the curtains were red or the ceiling was blue. You know, so it's not that it, selectivity in, t in terms of focusing on a, a core area or an important area, I think it, it's not the same as the kinds of issues that are raised by bias or by issues of balance or accuracy. I mean, that's certainly my view. Anyway. The, this, the, and I had the argument you've just put in several, I remember a while ago in some of our books we argued about this. The, the a second thing I would say is that um, in terms of the few, uh, you know, the, the content and, and quality of the last election, one of the things that I think is very important is that, uh, but that people on the right of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Labour spectrum or Labour Party or whatever seem to forget they lost the last two elections and the reasons why that was. That, 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 that there would seem to be an almost complete inability to express a clear alternative message. That, the, that what seemed to me just fantastic <coughs> levels of incompetence in dealing with right-wing political messages, like, for example, that the Labour Party had produced the deficit, that it was Labour overspending, which became almost a kind of article of faith you know, uh, in the media, and was just not challenged, you know, and, and was utterly false. It was simply wrong. What had happened to create the deficit was quite simply that after the financial crash, as you probably know, the, the world economy dipped, therefore there was an increase in unemployment, therefore tax revenues <coughs> fell, and there was therefore a gap between tax revenues coming in and government spending. And Gordon Brown quite properly argued that it, with all the rest of the, the leaders or main leaders of the world, that it was necessary to keep up spending or else we would go into a catastrophic economic decline. And, and Gordon Brown is seen you know, in, in the world as an absolute hero for having forced that line through. And that is what produced you know, a, a, a gap, that gap between government spending and and tax receipts. Nothing to do with labour overspending. It was a complete nonsense. The, the more interesting question is, why couldn't they resist that? Why didn't they just say it? It didn't take me very long to say that, did it? Why can't they say that? And, and I think that's because the, the situation inside the Labour Party was that Ed Miliband was seen as a bit on the left, not very. And that there are other people there who were very much on the right, following the legacy of Blair and Mandelson. And there was a conflict all the time between Ed Balls and between and Miliband's office. And it was as if they just were incapable of coherent action. That's, that's how I saw it. I mean, I used to write you know, the most incredibly frustrated letters to, to, to people who I knew at the heart of all of this and say, you know, people like John, John Trickett, for example, and I would write and say, for goodness sake, you know, I can write a paragraph, you know, with, with Anne Pettifer or something, you know, just to say, give it to everyone in the Labour Party so you can nail that lie. And I wrote this years ago you know, to, to them. And, and I got a reply, you know, from the office saying, oh, we can't say anything about the economy because all that goes through Ed Balls' office. And, you know, it was unbelievable that, that they were just so unable. So I think... That question of the issue of our own responsibility and the responsibility of the Labour movement to get its act together, to put out the information and, and show the clear alternatives, is absolutely critical. It's not enough just to blame the media. The, the, the final thing I was going to say is that uh, in the case of the question of the future of the media, it's, it's very interesting. I'm going to take on what you said. I think you're right. There are an enormously exciting time because of the range of possibilities 
of, of, of what there now exists. But my own view also is that the, the internet is not seen as a reliable source of news. It just isn't. When, when all the research, all the studies we've done, when we go out and ask people where they get the news from, you know, all young people say, oh, the internet, oh, I'll get it from the internet. And then you say, what are you looking at when you to say the word internet? I say, oh, BBC web page, exactly. or the Guardian web page, or whatever. And, and that is those sorts of news sources, or, or indeed uh, Russia Today for some people, or, or Al Jazeera or whatever. But those are big, major news producers. And the reason is that the, the, the small level interactive uh, productions on side, inside the, 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 the internet and, and through bloggers or whatever else are not often seen as very credible because there's been so many scandals around them. So when there is a crisis, people go to the big mainstream media and they're still using it. And my guess is that that is strengthening the media. Now we might talk about daily sales of papers going down. So the Guardian has 280,000, whatever it's selling. Now it's, you know, it doesn't sell huge numbers, but it has seven million readers online, and that is the future because we have all been trained to buy things online. And I think this is crucial. We are, and they all have our all these papers and news organisations have our details. If you want to vote on Strictly Come Dancing now, you put your, type your name in and your email and everything else. These, and the, these big organisations have all of our details. And at some point in the future, they'll say, oh, you know, you keep reading our paper and you've had a wonderful time reading all this, free all these years. Would you mind paying a fiver a month? You know? And we all, people pay for Sky News, they pay for Sky Football, they pay enormous amounts of money for social media, all the amount of money we pumped into Virgin and Branson through, through his control of... of, of communication systems. And, and I think when the papers and or these big organ media organisations say, look, you're going to have to pay a bit towards it, people will pay. A, a, a lot of people will. And, and that, I think, is probably their future. And they'll do it, and, and I think we'll probably prosper. But that represents a centralisation and a control by big media systems, not actually the diffusion which many of us would like to see. Though having said that, you know, the, the alternatives, Huffington Post, Canary, all the, and, and your, indeed, what you're doing, you know, does offer a, a, a range of other possibilities as well. Okay. Yeah, just to quickly follow up on that and then see if we can get a couple of bits. There was an interesting story talking about the um, Reuters and the news agencies that <laughs> control things. Um, it, is uh, that uh, we did an interview with David Malone, who's a Green Party member, who wrote a piece for Reuters on HSBC and their money laundering, the money laundering of drug money, and that they knew it, and that people were getting killed, getting killed maybe in the cover-up, getting killed as part of this story. Six people died. And when he tried to put it through Reuters, the... The, the legal head of the agency called him within 12 hours, and it's a huge agency, it's one of the three agencies that produce almost all the news in the world, called him and said, you know, not only do, do we need to, you need to agree to not publish this, to not talk about it, or else you'll lose your house. You know, and it's very rare that they're that open, because mostly journalists in particular places internalise certain values that they know better not push the boat too hard on this, that or the other, you know. But uh, it's very rare that they're that explicit. But, you know, he came out and talked about that in an interview. And that just gives you uh, an idea that if all the news is coming from these three organisations, that there is problems with that, if that's the only way that we're gathering hard news. Which then comes to the point from the person on the internet, yes, we do need to support local news and news alternatives because we need to guarantee our systems, our, our methods of collecting information. And this information is absolutely vital to making the democracy function. We need to hold power to account. And we need to tell the stories of everyday people, of people in society, and, what, and what's going on, and, uh, and how can we help there. If we're not informed, we can't work out what the solutions are. We don't know what the problems are, we can't work out what the solutions are to them. And um, I think we've seen that with Brexit, with the other discussions we've had, have been full of hyperbole and not really based on any information about society. So that's what I'm worried about in terms of bias. 
and I'm also worried about the control of, of news sources. But yes, now is a fantastic new time, it, um, and there's a period of time during this change that, as I think Greg quite, quite rightly pointed out, that there will be a re-centralisation, whether it's through Facebook, which is actually looking to become a news publisher, right? So next year it's launching its publishing platform, which means that you can automatically set blogs on there, but also the, the New York Times and the Washington Post will be putting all their, uh, their uh, journalistic reporting through Facebook rather than their own sites. Right? So maybe we will see Facebook and Google monopolise it. Maybe it will be that uh, there will be a re-centralisation around the Guardian, the BBC News. We don't know. But during the, the, this next couple of years, we have an interesting window where we can make alternatives grow to a level we've not seen before. And, and, and just to finally say that the Canary had 14 million uh, unique users last year. 14 million, reached 14 million people, um, which is a huge reach. Uh, because it's only one year old. It's only one year old. And for all the faults of the canary, if they're, you know, and people can debate the qualities of the journalism and so forth, it started off with no money, no following, uh, a very small uh, band of uh, unpaid journalists. And within a year, it pays, like, uh, I, I can't remember how many, quite a lot, I, th I think about a dozen journalists. It's got uh, strict editorial standards, it's got an investigative journalism fund, it's got a legal fund, it's got whistleblowers coming to it, it's doing investigations with Channel 4, um, and it's uh, got income and supporters. This is in one year, so this is a great time for us to start exploring the uh, alternatives. Right, let's uh, take a few more contributions. Got one, yeah, go one, two, yeah. Okay. We'll start off with you actually, if that's all right. Yeah. 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 Just say, uh, just off the back of what you were saying about uh, the role of the media and Facebook specifically, do you see there being any issues with regards to um, revelation, well, revelation, but what about especially about how Facebook's algorithms and how they control what their users see? Mm -hmm. um, it's just a thoughts on that and how that could. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, any question for the panel? Um, just interested in your thoughts about uh, media regulation and whether we need to top up regulation. Um, the reason I ask is if we, when we look at the current migrant crisis and some of the language issues around that, it can be quite dehumanising and loaded. Um, an example being using the word, the word jungle to describe Cali became quite a kind of mainstream. Uh, what to use in the mainstream media. Um, so just, yeah, for the, the needs more regulation, what would that look like? And how would we get that? Uh, yes, sorry, here. Yeah. yeah, sorry, my name is John Matthews. <clears throat> I'm one of Scotland's two representatives um, on the National Executive Council of the National Union of Journalists. And it's just really, I just really want to stand up for journalists. Journalists aren't the same thing as media owners if you like. Journalists actually, I mean, for example, um, one of our members who worked at The Sun told me a very interesting story. He had written a story to go on the front page of The Sun, and he actually stood and watched that story being changed sentence for sentence, and then put on the front page with his name on it. So he then became the public eye, the person responsible for that. But he was not responsible anymore. He, he was responsible at the beginning for writing the real story, but then that would be changed, and the company left him responsible for that change. And in terms of the pressures on journalists, I mean, someone mentioned the wealth that these companies have. And one company in Scotland, uh, Johnson Press, they made one of our members redundant. And he was quite a, he was a very nice man, I'll put it that way. And he was very influential. They made him redundant. Almost the same night, I was standing at the Scottish Parliament with another journalist from this newspaper he worked on. And she was talking about the enormous amount of work that she had to take on because he had been made redundant. But the next day, and I find myself getting quite emotional in this, there was a phone call, and there had been numerous phone calls the night before, thanking the NUJ for the work they had done. And the phone call the next day 
Christian, this man's wife, to say that he had killed himself because of the pressure put on him by his job and the pressure put on journalists. So it's just to say that I want us to be very careful that we understand the distinction and the difference between journalists and what is happening, what is happening to journalists. Thanks. Is there any more contributions or questions before um, we take this final round? Because I think that would be where we end. So yes, please. Hi there. Um, I'm a media educator. I've been working in inner city Scottish schools for the last 20 years. And one of the things that I've, I'm an English and media educator, and one of the things that's become very um, apparent to me over the last 20 years is that one of the genius strokes of the mainstream media is that it instructs poor people to make poor people scapegoats. Um, and so the, the structure is that poor people blame each other and poverty form, which was brought up earlier on via the street, etc, etc, is obviously a thing that young people are trained to do, and it's very, very difficult to talk them out of that. So I would like some guidance from the panel on what we can do specifically to help young people work through that mire of information that they're surrounded by. Um, and our colleague over here from the NUG have come the support of you know, to get the ideals and your perspectives. <coughs> As um, a union representative, but I think your know, man at the sun is completely complicit unless he challenged his employers. Thank you. Um, Impossible, because you get. Is it, is it right if you do it afterwards? Because you made a relatively long conclusion. I want to take some voices that maybe haven't spoken. Is there anyone else in here who hasn't spoken that would like to speak? Because I'd, uh, I'd love to hear that. We'll also make ourselves available at the end to chat. Can I just add something about media, media literacy, which a uh, gentleman back here was talking about, and, and just here. Um, I think the death of old media was declared far too early during the Scottish Independence referendum. I think that was decided by old media, the television, the newspapers, I think Brexit was decided by old media. But certainly new media is on the rise. However, what I see, I also work in schools, young people are getting information from Facebook. They're not going on to Bella Caledonia. Wings over Scotland, they're getting pop ups in Facebook, and that can be quite right wing, and that's where their information is coming from. And I think there's perhaps some willful delusion amongst all these new organisations, which are fantastic, that all new media is left wing or centrist or honest. It's not. People in the right are taking control of new media options as well. And I'd like to know what the panel has to say about ways to combat that. Well, I'll ask the question, but I need to run. <laughs> okay, sure. If, um, if you take this, mate, here you go. Well, if you take one of these flies, it's got our email address, and then we can uh, let you know. But check us out. Yeah, we'll put up the video in about a week. Okay. Cool. Uh, any further ones? I think we could. Those are really, really interesting, great contributions. Um, I'm just wondering where to start, who to start with. We'll just start again with Angela. Sure. I'll right. try and be quick, because I know that's quite a lot of points um, that have been raised. On the algorithms thing on Facebook, this does worry me quite a lot because um, if I've said earlier on that one of the things that I think has been wrong with media is that it has been controlled by uh, interests that want to make money, well Facebook and Google also want to make money, so I don't think it's good to just transfer that from one system to another system. And the ability that they then have to control the distribution of that news, I think, is worrying as well. So it, it's the way things are going, that's certainly true. And we need to accept that and try and work with it. But I think that as journalists, we should be very wary and we should be taking a big interest in that. Um, just to come back to your point quickly on that about Facebook and how there actually was a study done just recently by Fraser Stewart. Um, about the readership of the new media, I, don't know, I, I mean, it was a fairly decent sample, it was over a thousand, I think. And he found that, interestingly, actually, the majority of the readers of, of Bella Caledonia, Wings Over Scotland, Common Space, were actually more within, I think, the kind of 
30 to 45 age group. It wasn't young people. When I went and spoke um, at... Like, well, I'm, I'm 30, I'm 30, so I can get away with saying that. But I, I, I spoke at a, a college uh, class once about media. All young people, 18, 19, 20, none of them had heard of Common Space or any of the other ones. So you're right, the, the idea that this is all appealing to young people is actually not quite true. But that makes it interesting in Scotland, because usually new media does appeal to young people. We're appealing to a different range, and I think that, that I'm curious as to why that is. I'd like to see more study on that. The question about press regulation is a particularly good one, because... Yesterday, in press, the regulator was officially recognised as the first officially recognised UK press regulator. Complicated story, Levison related, but basically the breakdown is that the Press Complaints Commission was kind of humiliated through Levison for its failures, disbanded, and those publishers, so we're talking Rupert Murdoch, News UK, Daily Mail, Telegraph, all that kind of type, they all went away and formed Ipsos which critics would say is just another version of the Press Complaints Commission and refuse to comply with Levison recommendations and with the government's new royal charter. Impress came along and wanted to comply. So there are two, there is a big battle going on with Impress regulation right now. Common Space is leaning towards Impress. We can't join up to it, so coming from the position that we come from, it's not possible, we couldn't do it. The only option for us is Impress, and one of the big appeals for that for us there is that there is legal financial protection, which is really important for us. And the question of whether regulation is strong enough, I think that we need to, as angry as I understand that people get about what they're reading in the media, you have to be very, very careful that you don't go down the road of wanting to restrict the media. Because if you start restricting the freedom of the press, it will bite you back. It will hurt you. It, the, the views that you think will not be affected by that will be affected by it. It becomes a tool that people use to shut down other forms of debate and forms of discussion. Be very, very wary of doing that, of calls to shut things down. My position is not shut it down necessarily, but oppose it. Use, use that freedom to say something else. Not, don't try and shut down what someone else is saying. Just oppose it, fight it and win it. That's a better option for everybody all around. The editorial line of journalists, and this is kind of what you were talking about here. I, I do feel sorry for a lot of journalists. I think they get a really hard time for things that aren't actually their fault. And, and people don't necessarily understand the editorial line of newspapers and how that works, which is why, when I said before, understanding the mechanics of news reporting is really important if you want to criticise the media and actually fight it with any effect. You have to understand the nature of the beast, if you like, and a lot of people really don't get that. So I would urge you to take a bit of time, open your mind to that. And open your mind to the fact that the ideas that you might have had before now might be wrong. Um, it's easy to say that yes, you should, you should be fighting your editor or you should be arguing about that. One of the things that Impress has done actually, which is interesting, is that they want to create something that means that journalists can have a whistleblowing hotline, that means that they can phone up and make a report if their editors are trying to get them to do something that they think is unethical. This is a, as a result of some of the stuff we saw happening at the News of the World and the Sun phone hacking. Because what was basically happening was the media was becoming so competitive that people who had families, jobs, were relying on their paycheck, who needed their wages coming in, who needed to support their family, were finding it harder and harder to keep their jobs and they were being dem the demands on them to do more and more unethical things were rising. It's easy to say that you should just oppose that. It's not as easy for people necessarily when you're in that position and you've got responsibilities. And I think that the way to tackle that is to do something like Impress is doing and give journalists other options, give them a way to get out of that rather than necessarily demonising the individual because journalists are human, they're not some sort of other species and I think we sometimes feel like they are, but it doesn't really work that way. Also the idea that the media instructs people to do things. What do we mean when we say that the media instructs anyone to do anything? I'm curious about how people feel like the media instructs them to do I'm things. I think mental as a sister. Obviously, we <coughs> all have voice, one particular voice saying, think this way. It's a systematic way of putting out messages that happen generation after generation. And these are ideas that are handed down through generations, particularly from parent to parent, parent to child. And when we speak to young people and we get them to challenge headlines, they find that they don't, they don't have the apparatus to challenge those headlines. 
the etc's and plus the truth. These, these headlines, these ways of expressing ideas, these ways of selecting um, images, the way of you know, juxtaposing images with you know, text, etc, etc, and putting those things across in all forms of media, it, it, it's very difficult for people to make informed choices. So it's not one voice they do this, it's not mm -hmm. like a God thing, but it's a systematic, you know, you know, it's a collusion that is very, very hard to be done. Yeah, but I'm still just a bit worried about the idea of saying that media instructs because media is a big thing and we, we talk about it very, like, the media does this, the media as a whole does this thing. The media is made up of a lot of parts and there's some really bad examples. I come back all the time to the Mail, the Express, the Sun. I mean, I really, there is no defending what those newspapers have done and how inaccurate a lot of that reporting is. You, there is no defending that. However, there are other newspapers out there, and if, for example, you do have elected politicians, for example, at the Tory party conference, who are making these horrible claims about things like xenophobia, it's not necessarily the, the media that is instructing someone to think a certain way because they're reporting what a politician has said. And that's one of the things that the, about what I'm talking about with the mechanics of news reporting, where I think it, people, it would help to understand I wrote a piece recently, I'll just finish on this, for Bella Caledonia. Have a read at it, if, if you fancy it. It was about <coughs> the Express. Every, did everyone see that article that the Express done recently about how there was viol out, out, what was it, widespread outbreaks of violence on the streets of Scotland during an independence referendum? It was a pretty outrageous article with all these claims in it, and it painted Scotland like a war zone, a total war zone, and the rest of us were reading it thinking, that's not what happened. I was there. Nothing like that happened. But the portrayal of it was that way. Someone made a complaint to Ipso. The Express is regulated by Ipso. Ipso decided that the Express had been accurate, hadn't breached any guidelines on accuracy. So I'd done a piece taking apart the article and showing why that was true, why they technically hadn't br broken the rules of accuracy. And it's important if you're saying about the, the idea of actually combating that by talking to people and explaining them, especially to young people, how the media <coughs> operates and how it's possible to create these things and have it technically be accurate, but there is a bigger picture and it's not actually true. It's not a true representation. You need to understand how the news is put together. That's why the thing you're doing tomorrow night, the media training workshop, even if you don't necessarily want to go out and be a journalist, that's a really useful thing to come to because you need to understand how it's going on behind the scenes if you really want to fight it effectively, I think. And this is where I think a lot of the, I think what frustrates you is it feels like journalists sometimes and readers are speaking completely different languages and we're very hostile to each other. Murtagh was literally walking through his office knocking people in the head. But again, I, I would say the sun is, so, a, is an example of really bad but practice but in journalism. Especially so. it was about poor people, it was about how the media targets poor people, knowing thing well that they don't have access and they won't, they won't make the sort of you know, voyages that we all make people in this room. So I think that the media, that, that organised Rupert Murdochian media does something. And I think for us to take a combative stance against that, it's actually okay as long as it's within control and as long as it's within a sort of, you know, decent dialogue. I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a combative stance against that. Yeah, I agree with you, but again, I would say The Sun is a very specific example, and there is other media out there. There's other media out there that's doing it better, a lot better. The problem for me is if we lump everything under the media, we tend to demonise all the media, and we don't always you, reward I good practices. And I am sorry for talking to my colleague in that way, but it was his fault. I, I realise he's got a mortgage to pay, but I have met many journalists from that part of you know, the board people quite politely just kind of go, well that's my job, I'll do that. Yeah, I don't well, like that. Right. Um, no, we defend journalists. And one, of the, one of the things we have to defend journalists increasingly, increasingly on, is being made redundant in the drop of a hat. You're thrown out. And these journalists are people, and we've got to remember it, and I think some of it was mentioned there, we've got to remember, these journalists are not they are individual. I'm talking about individual. I'm talking about people. And that guy that was telling me that story, again, is a man who was married and had two children. But what you're suggesting to me, as far as I can understand it, is what he should have done there when the, as editor was changing that story. He should have stood up and said, my principle is you can't do that. Don't you dare change that story. What did he done that to I'm leaving. No, is this Sorry, if you're off. 
Yeah. I'm here to represent my organisation because I interviewed that boy with his mates today to find out a bit more about what's going on because I want my community to be informed of what's going on and I don't see a lot of journalists talking to my community. Yeah, yeah that's by the way, uh, Sunny Govan FM checking out. Yeah. the communities in the world. Yeah. No, actually, if it's possible, I can come back on them on some on some of the points made, and then potentially move on to the other speakers if that's okay. You've made more noise than anybody in here, Of course, Of course, mate. Um, no, I think it, I think that's exactly the, the the point that is trying to be made here. And I think you're exactly right, which is that uh, uh, whilst the media is a complex machinery and it's not as a game, uh, say you know top hats and cigars and so forth in a back room we know that that largely journalists are recruited from a particular social class that is associated with a particular standard of education and a particular understanding of the world and that it's not just that but for the many of the reasons that I outlined at the beginning that there is a way of presenting consistent image creating the Overton window of talking about particular subjects where, for instance, we've seen, and studies have been done on this, that the poor have been demonised. I think that's perfectly correct. It's absolutely supportable. Uh, and you're right, basically. It, that, that has occurred. Having said that, there are, and the ESRC, the European Social Research Council, did studies on this, there are pre-existing biases of poor people on other poor people. It's not very good to me, that, Thomas. No, I'm, I'm, I live in one of the poorest, in one of the poorest communities in Scotland. And I don't really get that, man. I don't I grew up between the Gargles and Fergus the Park, who are obviously historically portrayed as the worst slum housing in Europe. I'm still alive. Yeah, I'm still I, working in my community. I, and I respect is, that. And what that yeah. lady there saying is there's not been any, any investment in media literacy. Yeah. I actually, myself had to steal a book for Westminster when I was down there because that was the only time I ever came across a book on media literacy. So I stuck it in my pocket. Yeah. Because I could learn for that. But what the lady saying is, Nobody's getting to schools. And again, you've got to remember, if the pupils in the school have a mum and dad, then the mum and dad combined probably don't earn as much as their teacher. Yeah. So if a teacher comes into their community, what does the teacher teach them? Yeah. What, is the teacher to be individual, entrepreneurial type people? I don't think so. Yeah. They're perpetuating the same thing, because as you say, as the journalists and teachers, we come to a certain class background. Because yeah. not a lot of them are. People in my background get to university, so they're never going to become teachers or lecturers or journalists. Yeah. I'm, just, yeah, I'm a journalist that didn't go to university, yeah. and I, I come from the same background as you. I, 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 what the lady was saying there, and I heard that this morning, was in the local newspaper, uh, news agents or the snack map, you'll only get the sun and the record available. Mm. So they're only really reading the headlines that you can see in the front page. And that's a conversation and chat for the day. And as the lady says there, if they're portraying people who are immigrants, refugees, whatever, I grew up in Govan Hill. That's still the most, the most diverse place in Scotland. And I've done work and research in Govan Hill, and I've had the most tremendous bile and bigotry to that community. But a lot of that came from people who didn't come from Scotland or the Govan Hill. They were the Irish or they were the Asian. Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, I, think, okay, like, sorry, I think we agree. Okay, like, so, I think we do agree on that. Yeah. Okay, so. So we've got about five minutes left. I do apologise, but we've got about five minutes left, and we want to try and tackle these things. And certainly, we can we can have a bit more of a chat. Um, so talking, uh, yeah, talking on those things. There are certain things that can be done. What I'll do is bring in Adam and Greg now, and then I'll, I'll finalise and we'll we'll uh, and we'll call it a day because we've got about five minutes left officially in the room being booked. I'm sure it's quite warm and stuff like that. Having said that, if you wish to stick around longer than that for discussion, I'm more than up for it, and hopefully one or two of the speakers are as well. Um, so yeah, cool. Adam. I mean, so on that and on um, what John was saying, my general attitude in all these things is blame the system, not the worker. And you know, e even if you think that people are you know, complicit in a problematic system. I, I kind of feel like we're all complicit in capitalism and, I, you know, in order to get away from a capitalist world, you have to partake in that world in some way and that is engaging in exploitative practices. We're all, you know, we're all involved in practices which in some way are causing problems for other people. Now, 
where people are capable of drawing lines, as exactly as John says, depends on both their personal circumstances, but also that means you know, people, we're all very good at justifying to ourselves morally what we're doing, even when others around us might think those things are immoral. I don't think it's helpful, you know, if, even if you think someone is complicit, a helpful response to that, I don't think, is to sort of shout at them and denounce the space. I'm not saying you're, you're doing that, but people do on Twitter all the time. You see this endlessly. Journalists who are, you know, at risk of losing their job, they've seen all their colleagues losing their job, they uh, didn't have nearly as long as they would have had ten years ago to write their story, they fuck up and then everyone just notes them on Twitter. Like, we all fuck up in our jobs all the time. And, you know, try and be a bit kind. Remember that people... Um, yeah, the system's totally, you know, it's got huge problems with it. We need to replace that system entirely. But don't be cruel to the people who are trying to survive within that system because we all are. I think it's an important general principle. I mean, there's a different question about those who are the owners, those who own newspapers, the, you know, the, the sort of ultimate bosses of these organisations. And I think, you know, conflict with them I'm totally fine with. But beyond that, I, I do think that there's a huge problem that, you know, journalists are uh, endlessly being denounced on social media, you know, whereas other people can just leave Twitter. You can't leave Twitter if you're a journalist because if Twitter and Facebook are how you promote your work and you spend your whole life getting you know, threats and death threats and, and so on. And that is a huge part of the experience people have and a very well made point, John, I thought. Um, there was lots of other stuff and we've not got time to deal with it, but I only picked one of them, which was that Facebook came up a few times and just to give a sort of anecdote from my work, I mean, we largely what we publish is long essays. But we increasingly publish more and more videos, partly because videos is what social media promotes, and we rely hugely on traffic coming through Facebook in particular, and also Twitter to an extent. But that's changed recently to go even more extreme, where basically Facebook will promote videos which are on Facebook. So a lot of what we do now is just make videos and put them straight onto Facebook. So you know, we, are, we would call ourselves a website, but increasingly what we do is produce content which doesn't even go on our website particularly, it goes straight onto Facebook. And that will be the case more and more. And, of course, the problem is that that means I think I edit the website, but ultimately, actually, the website that I'm pushing things on is Facebook, and that's edited by Mark Zuckerberg. And whether you, you know, whatever you think of Mark Zuckerberg's politics, and he's a sort of on the liberal end of neoliberal, I would guess, but, you know, not, not the most awful, but certainly not my politics, that's terrifying. You know, the idea that basically one man is running, is the editor of this, the biggest media empire in human history and can make decisions about what does and doesn't go on it, what does and doesn't get promoted on it, is a huge problem we're going to be facing in the future. So, you know, we've talked about kind of potential positives and how the internet has liberated a lot of this stuff, and certainly it has, but there's also huge risks coming up with basically the centralisation into Facebook, maybe YouTube and Twitter and a couple of other platforms, which are owned by a very small group of people with a huge amount of power. Thank you. Greg? I've lived in Scotland for over 40 years. I lived in Govan Hill for, for a while, doing Langside Road, just around the corner from the Govan Hill Baths. You probably learned to swim now, shouldn't you? I had my 10 pence impression. I've lived there for a while. I've met a lot of different people in Scotland, a lot of working class people, a lot of middle class people. I felt I'd met good, what I would call good, radical, left-wing, socialists, educated people, thoughtful people. I've met people who were mixed up, didn't know if they were right-wing or left-wing. I've met people who were deeply racist. In education, where I now work, I'm not going to get into this business of how working class I am or where I came from, but my, my family didn't have any education. I got in through luck to university and through the 1948 Education Act, essentially. But the point is that I've met loads of different people in education. And if you go to universities, you can find departments where they teach people how to be speculative international bankers, and you can find places in universities where there are you know, the best kind of critical, thoughtful, alternative ideas that you can come across. You can look at the, the difference between a economics department somewhere and somewhere like the Peace Studies Department in, in Bradford University. I mean, enormous differences and enormous differences within students as well and their motivations and intentions. But I wouldn't put, make a generalisation about education and all educators or all teachers any more than I would about all people in the working class because it would, it would be wrong. There are very many different people, different motives, different intentions, different kinds of activities. Some are 
cherish and work for and think are absolutely brilliant, and others I, I think are poisonous. But that's part of the struggle we're in. We're involved in an enormous arc of cultural change that stretches back centuries. And we fight at all different levels in all of those different places. And education is a critical part of that struggle. What was John McLean, the great Scottish socialist, other than a teacher? John McLean, the fighting dominic, as he was called. Domini means teacher. Those of us like me are not very good at Latin. That's the point I'm making. We're in a, the middle of an enormous cultural, historical struggle, and we have all of a part to play in that. And there's no point in saying that some bits are more important than others, or some personal histories are more important than others, or whatever. I can't see the point of it. I've never argued my own position by saying I come from, you know, I grew up in the shadow of Erith Docks or something. It doesn't make any difference. What matters is where you're going, not really where you come from. And that is how we judge people. We judge people by their ideas and by how they put those ideas into practice, and we judge people by what they do. And if they contribute to that great arc of historical change that is progressive, then that's good. And if they don't, if they, then, we, then we oppose it and we say, what you're doing is wrong. And that's, that's where I stand. And I, I think it's where really we should all stand. Okay. Thank you. Um, on that note, then I'll uh, finally <laughs> giving up the ghost. Um, uh, yeah, I'd sort of end on a, a quote by Gramsci. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and it, it follows on from this. It, that there are people that whatever background or wherever they're going from, they're creating a common sense. And uh, Gramsci said, you know, quite famously, it's like, you know, that there are certain ideas that are common sense that are no good for us. You know, they're, they're no good, they divide us, they engender hatred and disrespect and um, all kinds of problems for society. What we, don't need, what we don't need is common sense. What we do need is good sense. And I'm hoping that today, the people in this room can be part of that change of changing common sense to good sense across society, across the world. Thank you very much. Uh,